If it was guilt they felt, they would never find closure. You see, Waugh's murderer was never caught. A Boston detective was hired onto the case, and he said he was close to breaking it. But then he skipped town unexpectedly. Hi guys, Julianne Walshot back here in Littleton, New Hampshire, this time to bring you the sight, sounds, and even taste of Littleton's second Friday art night event. Earlier this year, the Linden Outing Club had tried to get together a petition that would request $10,000 for snowmaking equipment that would pick up where Mother Nature's left off. A former St. Johnsbury town manager has found a new job. Ralph Nelson is now the executive director at New England Disabled Sports after the select board fired him from his last position last April. Plus, how is this fuzzy face helping to support disaster relief across the state? New 7 starts right now. If you are out walking on a trail and come across a muddy area like this, it's best to just keep going. Venturing off to the side will only damage vegetation or widen the trail even more. Now the other day there was work done to the roof. These projects are not directly related to the upcoming million dollar project, but they do help to contribute to the overall goal of maintaining this historic building. Two Linden State College students involved in a gym confrontation with law enforcement that led to three arrests say the whole thing is misunderstanding. No longer will customers be able to come in and grab an old movie off the shelf. Now, they're going to be settling for a much smaller selection renting from a machine like this. Hey guys, I'm Julianne Walshaw and we're here in Littleton, New Hampshire to celebrate Pollyanna Glad Day. It's a day when a community can come together, be happy, be positive, and just have a great time. And all of these cuddly friends like Sweet Fletcher Frog here are actually Vermont natives made by Mary Meyer, a family-run toy company out of Townshend. Four? I think it's way too little, way too late. It's a systemic problem. It's not, you know, the antibiotics are, it's an issue, yes, and they're bad, but it's basically, it's, it's, it's because of the living conditions, the housing conditions of these animals that they have to do it. Farmer Rob Martin hardly ever gives his animals antibiotics as they're able to roam freely in the pastures of Chandler Pond Farm, but others don't have that luxury. Unfortunately, it's part of agribusiness. Um, in order to make money, they have to really pack animals into really tight spaces that aren't actually very healthy for them. Um, right because there. of the in conditions, the, the tight quarters, the you know, they're basically wandering around in their own manure, um, they have to give them antibiotics to keep them healthy. Um, and even when they're not sick, they, they just do it you know, to, as a preventative measure. Martin also teaches a biology lab at Linden State College and explains that overusing antibiotics will kill bacteria, both good and bad. But some will survive based on genetic makeup and reproduce. This results in a colony of antibiotic resistant bacteria that may make its way to meat and dairy consumers. But Martin doesn't think that should be the largest concern. It's what we're not getting from the meat. I mean, bacteria is actually a good thing for us. It's, it's, you know, it's, we're, it's necessary for our survival um, and part of our, our kind of micro ecosystem. So we can be killing a lot of things that we don't even know are helpful to us. This is a topic the FDA has been talking about for years, and the conversation is likely to continue. Julianne Walshaw, News 7, Lindenville. Since 1972, each clink of a bottle returned to a redemption center is a cha-ching of 5 to 15 cents in the Redeemer's pocket as part of the state's most successful recycling program. I think the bottle bill in Vermont has become uh, almost a cultural thing for many folks. It's a really important environmental law. You might think of it as uh, similar to the ban on billboards in the state. It's something that Vermonters are proud of, that, that virtually all Vermonters participate in and, and feel good about. Originally, the bottle bill was passed to reduce roadside litter. So now you have a situation where people will pick up deposit containers but leave other forms of litter, which weren't as prevalent when the bill was passed. The Vermont Public Interest Research Group says 85% of beverage containers with the nickel deposit are recycled, but only about 36% of other containers, such as water and juice bottles, stay out of landfills. This is why many believe an expansion to the bottle bill is a good idea. Um, personally, I'd like to see uh, the bottle bill expanded to include all glass containers, because glass is one of the few things we don't make money on. So it would be nice if the deposit system handled all the glass containers, and then we would focus on the, the other things. 
Proposed House Bill 375, which is still bottled up in committee, would allow the redemption system to include water bottles and other non-carbonated beverage containers. It would also take the deposit money that distributors keep when consumers don't redeem. In a, in a state like Vermont, that could be $3 million annually going to, for instance, helping to support other recycling programs. That would be a huge benefit to the state right now and something we ought to implement immediately. The bill is in trouble because some, like Democratic Senator Robert Hartwell, support the idea of getting rid of it altogether, believing the universal recycling law, which bans all recyclables from landfill in 2015, will be suitable for litter control. Andy Upton, a third-year bottle sorter at the Lindenville Redemption Center, would hate to see the bill dropped. That would put me out of a job, first of all, um, and my friends that I've worked with for years and known for years would be out of a job, um, and that would really impact this business negatively in itself. I mean, this is a huge part of the business here. Julianne Walshaw, News 7. Hey guys, I'm Julianne Walshaw, and we're here in Littleton, New Hampshire to celebrate Pollyanna Glad Day. It's a day when a community can come together, be happy, be positive, and just have a great time. Pollyanna's statue is the centerpiece of historic downtown Littleton, acting as an ambassador of cheer and community spirit, as well as a way of paying tribute to a historic Littleton native. This year was community celebration plus a centennial, a Pollyanna centennial, because the author, Eleanor H. Porter, was born in Littleton, New Hampshire in 1868. And in her life, she was a wonderful musician and singer, but she loved the her hometown and she imagined it in a fictional story with a fictional character Pollyanna. So Pollyanna Day becomes a celebration of the personality and attitude, the spirit of gladness that in the fictional character it was um, a perfect kind of rapport with people. Today, visitors flock to Littleton's Main Street to enjoy both the shopping and fine dining offered. Grab a table at Chang Thai Cafe to enjoy a taste of traditional Thai cuisine. Maybe after, you can catch a flick at Jack's Jr. or discover the sweet life at Shutters, home to the world's longest candy counter. There is an awful lot to do in town that will keep you coming back again and again with a community that will always welcome you. Like I said, we're a pop positive, upbeat uh, community. You notice on the sidewalk it says stop, wave, smile, stop, smile, wave. Uh, and and uh, if you've tried to cross the sidewalk here, or try across the street, you know traffic stops. We're a very friendly, upbeat, happy town. So make your way to Littleton, New Hampshire, and while you're there, be sure to give Pollyanna a wave hello. Today is National Feral Cat Day. A feral cat may look like your average house cat, but due to a lack of human contact, they revert to a wild state and have a serious fear of us, choosing to fend for themselves. There are thousands of feral cats living in colonies all across the country. Well, today is dedicated to spreading awareness about this problem and literally trying to fix it. Now, I say literally because according to alleycat.org, only 2% of all feral cats are spayed or neutered in the U.S. Well, one local animal shelter is doing their part to help. Catamount Film and Arts will host their first ever 48-hour student film slam. This is a team competition where groups of young filmmakers write, produce, and premiere an original short film, all in just two days. The film slam will be on April 4th and run until April 6th. Now, the grand prize for the winning team is $1,000. Anyone interested in participating should email the 48-hour student film slam director and check out the event at catamountarts.org. The Justice Department is investigating whether General Motors broke any laws in response to the recall of the Chevy Cobalt. 1.6 million cars have been recalled due to faulty ignition switches, which has led to over 30 crashes and unfortunately 13 deaths. The recall is for models from 2003 to 2007. Evidence shows that GM has known about the faulty switches since 2004, and GM could face a $35 million fine. 
flags are being lowered as a mark of respect for the memory of former South African President Nelson Mandela, who passed away yesterday evening. Mandela was South Africa's first black president and advocated for abolishing white minority rule in the country. All flags should return to full staff on Monday, December 9th. The Vermont Grocers and Retailers Associations have combined. They are the two largest lobbyist groups for Vermont businesses. In fact, together they will cater to 830 businesses across the state. They will now be known as the Vermont Retail and Grocers Association and Jim Harrison will lead this new organization. A new group for Vermont innkeepers is looking to get their voices heard in state policy. The Vermont Inn and Bed and Breakfast Association has about 75 members. One of their charter members is the East Estabrook House in St. Johnsbury. A member of the group, Don Huber, says without the group, the inns haven't been able to lobby effectively. Huber says they have had no input on the state lodging tax or tourism operations. Not your everyday accident off Route 5 and 122 today when a dunk tank that was being towed by a local driver fell off into the street after its hitch pin fell out. Lindenville police say 37-year-old Philip Brown was towing the tank when it spun across in and crossed into oncoming traffic. That's when police say the trailer collided head-on with a Toyota Corolla. Now the drivers of both vehicles were not injured. The dunk tank, however, shattered into pieces. What was left of the tank was towed away from the scene. And if you got a whole lot of shaking going on, but you're not on the dance floor, it may be time to beef up your muscles. We don't have to lose muscle mass as we age, and with a little effort, we can keep our muscles strong and firm as the years go by. And since the government has resolved its issues in Washington, the funding will continue for federal housing programs like Rural Edge here in the Northeast Kingdom. 600 families, including residents of the Darling Inn, receive federal funding from the government, which makes up nearly 70% of their cost of living. Rural Edge Representative Rachel Murrow says they were prepared before the government even shut down. The Vermont State College Board of Trustees has voted not to increase tuition at Linden State College over the next two years. The Barnett School Board has a surplus of money, so what are they planning to do with it? A new way to calculate water rates in Lindenville has some residents boiling. And finally, look at this cute little guy. Even the pups here in the Northeast Kingdom are awaiting the arrival of some sunshine. He's ready too. Thanks to Sherry Newton Toll in Barnet for that one. And let's see if we can bring any hope to these guys and turn things over to Amanda Curran, who joins us with our first look at our forecast. Amanda, you saw those pictures. People are thinking spring. And now everybody wants to know, when will it ever warm up? Amanda, the storm is already on our doorstep. What can we expect in the next couple hours? So, Jeremy, it was a little blistery out there today. How do you think our friends at Burke Mountain are faring at that rail jam? It was really windy out there and it was raining on and off. Is it going to get better? <laughs> Welcome back. And now Amanda Curran joins us with our full look at the weather. Amanda, how hard is it to ask for some 50s this time of year? <laughs> 